Hi, everyone. Lawrence Tribe is the Carl M. Loeb University Professor of Constitutional Law Emeritus at Harvard University and considered one of the nation's foremost scholars on constitutional law. He has argued before the Supreme Court a total of 35 times. He and former federal judge J. Michael Ludick have recently argued that Donald Trump should be ineligible to be president of the United States because of a clause in the 14th Amendment. Professor Lawrence Tribe, you're a longtime professor of law at Harvard Law School. It's great to see you again. And we're here to talk. Thank you. We're here to talk about the 14th Amendment. And I know you and Judge uh, J. Michael Ludick, who is a former federal judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, believe that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment effectively prohibits Donald Trump from ever being president again. Can you explain in simple terms how you've come to that conclusion? Sure. Both Judge Ludig and I have studied the 14th Amendment for a very long time. Um, I've been teaching about it for 50 years, and it is one of the most important parts of the Constitution. The 14th Amendment is the part of the Constitution that basically, after the Civil War, said that states cannot violate certain rights on the part of their citizens. But it also said in Section 3 that Anyone who takes an oath to support or defend the U.S. Constitution as an officer under the United States and who then engages in insurrection or rebellion against the Constitution can never again hold any office. It's very straightforward. We've never before had a president who, at least apparently, tried to turn the Constitution upside down by violating the provision that says, if you lose a presidential election, you leave. You don't try to hold on. You don't, among other things, have fake electoral slates or rile up a mob to sack the Capitol during the time that they are officially counting the electoral votes. And yet that is what it looks like Donald Trump did. So Judge Ludig and I concluded fairly simply that this basic protection of democracy, the provision that says you're not eligible for another bite at the apple if you try to crush it the first time, that applies to Donald Trump. And there are lawsuits all over the country making that argument one or another of them is bound to make it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court quite soon, uh, and then we'll have a definitive answer. Neither Judge Ludig nor I pretends uh, to predict what a court with three Trump appointees and some other very, very conservative members who are conservative, in my view, in name only. They're really quite radical. We're not predicting what they will do, uh, but We believe the Constitution contains this very important protection of democracy. So that's uh, that's the story. I understand this issue was being considered in both Minnesota and Michigan and judges in both of those states, Larry, said that the 14th Amendment would not preclude Donald Trump from being on the ballot in 2024. Colorado is now considering that same issue. What was your reaction about the findings in Minnesota and Michigan? It really wasn't too surprising because the state laws in Minnesota and Michigan make it much more difficult to take someone who is disqualified from the presidency and prevent that person from at least running in the primary. The state that says we're not going to run somebody in the primary if they're not qualified to hold the office is Colorado. And there was a week-long trial in Colorado. The verdict will be rendered by Judge Wallace either uh, tonight, Thursday night, uh, or Friday night, November 17th. It's, It's very specific. And whichever way she goes, that is, whichever way Judge Sarah Wallace decides, The losing party goes straight to the Colorado Supreme Court with a brief that's due Monday morning, November 20th. Um, That's the case that I think we really need to watch. 
One thing that I don't understand is there is a federal trial happening uh, in Washington, D.C. surrounding these same issues, Donald Trump's role in what happened on January 6th. How does that play into the legal process in terms of his ability to run for office again? The federal criminal trial, both the one in D.C., which is going to begin um, actually on March 4th with Judge Tanya Chutkin presiding, and the federal criminal trial in Miami presided over by Judge Cannon, uh, and the state criminal trials are completely unrelated to this. This is a provision that is not triggered by a civil or criminal verdict. It basically says, we're not trying to punish someone through this provision. We're simply trying to take them out of the running. Once you have taken an oath to the US Constitution for an office under the United States, if you then engage in an insurrection, and the definition of insurrection may be different in this context from what it is in the criminal context. Once you engage in an attempt to overturn the Constitution, you can't hold office again. So this does not depend on a conviction. In fact, one of the reasons that the 14th Amendment included this special protection against insurrectionists and rebels against the Constitution was the thought that the criminal process might not work that in fact the federal government might be in the hands of the insurrectionists as it in fact happened after Lincoln's assassination when Andrew Johnson, who was very sympathetic with the Confederacy, became president. He made it clear that he would not prosecute people who tried to overturn the Constitution on behalf of the Confederacy and that he would in fact pardon anyone who was convicted. So this has got nothing to do with whether Donald Trump will or will not go to jail as a result of the federal criminal trial that you're referring to in the District of Columbia. At the same time, it's my understanding that Donald Trump and his team of lawyers will say he did not instigate an insurrection, that he was merely telling people to, you know, make their feelings known, et cetera, et cetera. And it was not his intent to do that. So how can, I mean, it might be in the eye of the beholder, right? In terms of whether or not he did or didn't violate this statute in the 14th Amendment. Well, it's not in the eye of the defendant or in the eye of the objector. It's in the eye of the judge. And judges often have to make difficult decisions about who is telling the truth and what actually happened. In this case, there was a full trial for a whole week in Colorado, all day, every day, pretty much. And evidence was put on that related not only to the final violence on January 6th, but to events that go all the way back to the election. From the very moment of the election, there is evidence, very strong evidence, that Donald Trump said, I'm not leaving. I don't care who says I lost. I don't admit that I lost. I think the election was stolen. And he was willing to do whatever it took. The evidence over the past week in Colorado was very strong that he was directly involved in the fake electoral slates. And in addition to that, that he in fact did rile up the mob and very occasionally said, oh, be peaceful. But on the other hand, you know, he did everything he could to make sure they wouldn't be peaceful. But we will know what the trial judge finds based on all of the evidence. And Donald Trump's team had ample opportunity to put in evidence exactly trying to prove what you claim. He could have testified himself. It's a civil proceeding. He could have testified. He chose not to. So if the judge finds on the basis of the facts before her that he in fact did engage in or give aid and comfort to, which is also language in the Constitution, an insurrection or rebellion against the Constitution, the fact that Donald Trump says, 
I don't admit it. It's not true. That's just his opinion. And a judge's decision is going to be appealed to the Supreme Court of Colorado. And eventually it'll get to the U.S. Supreme Court. But the fact that there are different ways of looking at these events doesn't make it any different from what the framers of the 14th Amendment knew would happen. Of course, after the Civil War, it was a little bit easier to tell who was in the Confederacy and who wasn't. Can we go back to the historical reasons for Section 3 of the 14th Amendment? Because it had to do with the secessionists during the Civil War rejoining the government, right? Well, that was only the immediate occasion. The secessionists, the people who tried to tear the Union apart horizontally, basically, uh, they couldn't come back in unless two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate basically pardoned them, absolved them. That's a provision of the 14th Amendment. You can convince two-thirds of both houses that you should be allowed to play a role in government again. You could. But there was a lot of debate over whether this was a one-time only provision or whether it would stay in place in the event that we have a future revolution against the Constitution, future rebellion. As it happens, we ended up having a vertical rebellion. When I say vertical, I mean that the process through time by which one president hands over power to the next when someone else wins, that process is as basic to holding the union together as is the horizontal process that sticks the states into a union. This was a not a secession by the president, but an interruption, a deliberate interruption of the peaceful transfer of power. And there is no argument that anyone has made that's convincing to any lawyer that says that the 14th Amendment only deals with secession from the Union. It deals with any insurrection or rebellion against the Constitution. And the Constitution can fall apart along two at least different axes. It can fall apart if states pull apart and leave the Union, but it can also fall apart if we move to a dictatorship by someone who says, I may have lost the election, all the courts say I lost, but I am insisting on staying. If we have a president who does that, that destroys the Constitution every bit as much. Is there something in the Constitution that talks about the peaceful transfer of power as well? There is. Article 2, it's called the Vesting Clause, and it says that the presidency vests in the winner of the Electoral College for four years exactly, terminates at noon on January 20th of the year after the quadrennial presidential election. That is as clear as day. And from the very beginning, from the presidency of George Washington, even through the Civil War, despite all of the disputes that have happened about various elections, when someone is determined to have lost by the courts, by the Electoral College, that person has left office and the next one has come in. Why couldn't that be used against Donald Trump in addition to uh, the 14th Amendment? Well, it is being used in the sense that it is the provision that Judge Ludig and I have said makes clear that Donald Trump was engaged in an insurrection or rebellion against the Constitution and is therefore disqualified. The provision in the Constitution that says that the next president takes office at the stroke of noon on January 20th doesn't really tell you what to do with someone like Donald Trump, who says, yes, Joe Biden took office, but now I'm going to take another run at the presidency. Got it. Got it. Got it. So this is really what you're using to prevent future, uh, a future candidacy by Donald Trump, and that he violated Article 2 and, uh, and Article 14, right? Well, it's a, it's a little more it's a little more complicated. He basically tried to violate Article Two by staying in power. He did not succeed, so it was an unsuccessful coup. 
Joe Biden was sworn in, although Donald Trump did everything he could to prevent that. What do we do now when he wants to run in 2024? Well, one thing we can do is read the 14th Amendment. It says that somebody who mounts an insurrection against the Constitution, even an unsuccessful one, cannot be trusted to run again and hold office ever. And so what we do through the 14th Amendment is argue, as people have argued in courts around the country, that Donald Trump, because he tried, although unsuccessfully, to hold on to power in violation of the vesting clause of Article 2 of the Con Constitution, because he tried to do that, he was equivalent to the secessionists in the 1860s. People who, though they did not succeed ultimately, they lost the Civil War after all. People who, though they didn't succeed, tried to destroy the Union. They could not hold office again unless they were given amnesty by a vote of two-thirds of each House of Congress. So do you think that there would be a vote in Congress determining this, or now it's completely in the judiciary? Sand. It's in the judiciary unless Donald Trump said this isn't fair and tried to convince two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate that he should be relieved of this disqualification. As a matter of political reality, that ain't going to happen. That is, you're not going to get two-thirds of either House lifting this bar on Donald Trump. The fact is that Almost everybody in Congress, though some of them won't say it out loud because they're afraid of reprisal by Donald Trump or by others, almost everybody in both houses of Congress knows that Donald Trump tried to take down the country. That's why a majority in the House of Representatives, you will remember, impeached him. That's why 57 senators said he was guilty of insurrection. That wasn't enough. To, to disqualify him under the impeachment clause, which required a two-thirds vote. But now there is this separate avenue for keeping him off the ballot. You always hear the expression, don't make a federal case of it. Why couldn't there be a federal case arguing the same point? Why leave it to the states to adjudicate this? Well, there are two main reasons. First, the Constitution in Article 2 and the 12th Amendment creates a system in which the state legislatures decide how to select electors. And the presidential election, strange as this may seem, is basically run by the states. It's the states who decide who will be the presidential electors. Therefore, it is the states that hold primary elections. But there's another reason, and that is Voters who tried to go to federal court to argue that Donald Trump is disqualified don't have standing in federal court. In federal court, in order to invoke the judicial power, you have to show that you're individually hurt so that someone like Chris Christie, for example, could make a federal case out of it if he wanted. He could go to federal court and argue that he is harmed personally by Donald Trump claiming to be eligible for president despite the 14th Amendment. But no person, no other candidate, no one with an individual stake in the matter has gone to federal court. The only people who have tried to go to court are voters and citizens who've taken the position that we should not be put in a position of voting on someone who's not eligible to serve as president. The states, in some instances, like Colorado, open the door of their court to voters and citizens making that kind of claim. A state like Michigan didn't, which is why the lawsuit failed there. A state like Minnesota says, well, citizens and voters can go to court, but only for the general election, not for the primary. So we're dealing with an area that involves a very complicated intersection of federal law, state law, all kinds of complicated rules. Um, that's why it's rather hard in a short period to make it all very clear. Yeah. I think you're doing an excellent job, though. And I know that your argument is essentially an endorsement of a richly researched article to be published next year by two legal scholars, William Baud and Michael Stokes Paulson. 
Um, and you say that the evidence they lay out will, quote, influence, if not determine, the course of American constitutional history and American history itself. Uh, can you try to explain that to me? Well, basically, it's because someone who tried to become a dictator, which is one way of looking what Donald Trump was doing when he said, I don't care if I really lost, I'm going to stay in power. And someone who was announced, as he did last December, that he would terminate, that was the word he used, terminate the Constitution if he needed to in order to exercise power. And someone who has said through what he calls Project 25, that if he gets into power, he will use the power of the presidency to indict his critics, to imprison his opponents. We've heard that before. We've heard that before in the world. If we allow the United States of America to go down that path, we are doomed as a democracy. That's why I say, and that's why a conservative like Judge Ludig says, that what happens with this disqualification section will be so important. Now, it is possible, even if this disqualification argument fails, because, for example, the U.S. Supreme Court finds some way to rule for Donald Trump, that he will lose nonetheless at the ballot box. And because he doesn't have the military and the power of the presidency in his hands now, we may have a peaceful succession to a second Biden term. But there's no guarantee of that. Right. Know? I was going to say, but if the Supreme Court rules in his favor, i.e. Pr Donald Trump's favor, mm -hmm. and he wins the election, then what? then I think there's a danger that American democracy will come to an end because the presidency will be the, in the hands of someone who says, I am in here for vengeance. Vengeance against the people who aren't loyal enough to me. And the rule of law doesn't apply to me. Right. I am the law. We've heard that before in the history of the world. It's a scary thing. It's not just scary because of you know, what you learn in civics class. It's your freedom, my freedom, that are on the line. Nobody is really free if there's someone in power who has boundless power, who can imprison anyone who wants, who can pick an attorney general who will indict his critics, who will silence the media, silence the press. That's a scary prospect. And when people say it can't happen here, I have news for them. It can. How much confidence do you have in this Supreme Court, given that the majority of the justices are conservative? Well, conservative really is the wrong word. If you were conservative, you would want to conserve the most important thing we've got, which is our Constitution. They're not conservative. They're just right wingers. I'm not that confident, honestly, about what the U.S. Supreme Court will do. I'm somewhat more confident what the American people will ultimately do. Because despite the polls, I think when people really stare in the face, what it means to have a person in power who says, I'm not leaving, I'm here, get used to it, I've got an army, I can hire an attorney general who will go after my enemies, I won't respect the separation between the White House and the Justice Department, that is going to be a scary prospect for everybody. People might think, oh, I'm not in trouble. I've got money. I've got friends in high places. A lot of people said that in Germany in the 1930s. Other people have said that in Hungary and in China and in Russia. It doesn't work. Dictatorship spells the end of freedom, the end of law, the end of those things that protect everyone but the friends of the dictator. I'd like to ask you about the court cases really quickly uh, as we wrap this up. But before I even broach that topic, what do you think of the polls? The fact that right now, Donald Trump seems to be ahead of the incumbent president. They scare me. I, I don't think that a poll a year out um, is necessarily decisive. A lot of people who say, I don't mind that the president has been indicted 
but I won't vote for him if he's actually convicted. There are a lot of people who, after he is convicted in the District of Columbia case, and I think he will be next summer, um, are going to rethink whether they are in favor of him. Uh, they're going to look at what Biden has done for them and for their lives. They're not going to like how old he is. <laughs> That's clear. Uh, but I think in the end, between two old guys, one of whom seems to be crazed and in it just for himself, not respecting the law, and another old guy who respects the law and has made a lot of progress on the ground, as between those two, I think a lot of people will rethink it and end up voting against Trump. But I wouldn't wage my life on it, that's for sure. What if he is convicted in any of these cases, these four criminal cases in D.C., New York, Florida, and Georgia? Would any of those convictions preclude him from running for president in 2024? No. You can be a convicted felon and still run for president. That's insane to me. <laughs> well, it's the way the system is written. You can run for president from jail. Eugene Debs, I guess, did. Other people have. Um, we have a system that isn't perfect. It's better than any other in the world that I know of, but it isn't perfect. But I also wouldn't like a system that says that somebody has the power to prevent you from running for president just by finding a jury that will convict you. It's, you know, there's no perfect solution. Which of the four criminal cases against him do you think is the most serious? In terms of ultimate odds that he will be convicted and sentenced to prison, it's probably the one that goes after him and his unindicted co-conspirators in the District of Columbia. Um, but certainly the one that is before Judge Cannon in, in Florida that involves his violation of national security by holding on to national defense secrets and apparently showing them to people for his own benefit that's awfully serious, too, although it's a little harder for people to get their minds around it. The one in the District of Columbia is fairly straightforward. It basically says he tried to steal the election. It's more technical than that, but that's really the argument. Um, I think that's the one which people are most likely to rethink their support of the president, former president. But what about Georgia? Because my understanding is if he's convicted in Georgia... He cannot be pardoned. That's right. That is the president's pardon power. Even if he became president, a Georgia conviction he couldn't wipe out. But on the other hand, if he's president, there's no way that Georgia is going to be able to imprison him. Uh, he will use the powers of the presidency, even though the pardon power will not wipe the slate clean in Georgia. He will use if he becomes president again, the power of the presidency to put himself above all of the law. And I can guarantee you that. These cases are scheduled to be heard, I guess, in March, three separate felony cases. And then the classified documents case, which is being overseen by a judge very sympathetic to Donald Trump, apparently, um, is scheduled for May. So how do you see this all shaking out before 2024? Well, the March trial that will begin in the District of Columbia before Judge Chutkin is going to move with all deliberate speed. It will reach a conclusion before the election, probably before the Republican convention. The case before the very sympathetic Judge Eileen Cannon, who's done all kinds of bizarre things, though it's scheduled for May, I don't think is going to be tried before the election. She's quite sympathetic, not only on the merits, but in terms of timing. All sorts of efforts to delay seem to succeed in her court, but not in the court of Judge Chutkin, who is calling it just like it is. She's a very solid, good, straightforward judge. You've been teaching law Lawrence Tribe, for many years, you, I don't know how old you are at this point. May I ask? Sure. I, I'm 82. You're 82 years old. I mean, I'm sure you must shake your head and wonder, how did we get here? I think a lot of people are asking that question. When you think about it, what answer do you come up with? 
Well, I don't come up with a quick answer. Um, there are all sorts of forces that have combined to bring us here. Uh, Democrats often took people for granted, but much worse than that, there has been an undercurrent of racism and fear of the other, fear of immigrants, all kinds of concerns about people being displaced, people no longer knowing their place, the culture changing so quickly, the internet, which made it possible for people to have access to huge gobs of information, ends up serving to isolate people in their own little silos, their own little echo chambers, all sorts of things have come together in a kind of perfect storm that puts us at this hinge point in our history. There are some forthcoming books that try to examine how we got here and how, if at all, we might get out of it. Uh, but it's sort of above my pay grade to, to fashion a path out of the woods. It's, it's, we're in a difficult situation. I think political participation by more people people who vote even though they are not in one of the ideological extremes of the society, that could make the difference. I think if all eligible voters were to go massively to the polls in November 2024, it would be such a landslide, not so much for Joe Biden. A lot of people might not be enthusiastic about him, but I think it would be a landslide against the enemies of the Constitution and against Donald Trump. But only if everybody votes, because there are so many voter suppression efforts going on. There are so many people who have been lulled into apathy or hopelessness uh, that if people are passive and if people don't stand up for what is really best about America, and that is the inclusion of everybody, the idea that everyone is entitled to full and equal dignity, regardless of sex, regardless of, of gender, regardless of sexual orientation, regardless of race, ethnicity, nationality. If people don't stand up for those principles, then we're not going to retain a republic. As Benjamin Franklin said when he was asked famously at the end of the convention, what have you given us here, uh, Mr. Franklin? He said, we have given you a republic if you can keep it. And what that meant very simply was that it's in our hands. If we don't fight for the principles of a constitutional democracy and of a republic under the rule of law, then we will lose all of what we have built up in the last 225 years. That's a good place, I think, to end this conversation. Thank you so much for spending time with me today. It's really wonderful to see you and um, you and Judge Ludic, I think, are a formidable team, and I hope that you keep talking about this because there's so much news going on that I think, and I do feel like people have gotten apathetic, and I feel like our education system sucks. And <laughs> I think that's the technical term I'd use, our education system. <laughs> Sucks but, um, you know, I worry about my future grandchild, and I'm sure you're worried about yours, your current grandchildren. Absolutely. I'm quite worried, but I think it's in their hands. The future is in their hands as well as ours. Uh, and if we fail, I think it's not all over. They, they will have a chance to try. Well, it makes me feel like I'm going to go and make sure people are registered to vote and that they vote. I hope you do. Well, it's great to see you again. Great to see you, Thanks. Thank you again for your time. And, uh, you know, it's a real pleasure being with you. Same here. Okay. Take care. Take care. Okay. Good luck. Good luck with your future grandchild. Oh, thank you so much. I'll let you know what I have or what she, my right. daughter has. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're not finding out. They say it's one of the last surprises. Yeah, it's great. It's great to be surprised. Yeah. Anyway, take care and thanks again. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.